Today is September 3rd, and the boys from the back pocket are back. Decky, inside linebacker. How are we? Andy Football. We're good, dude. I'm fired up. This is going to be a great podcast for all of those football-oriented. But honestly, dude, much more than that, for people who don't even like football, you guys are just going to be absolutely blown away. But Andrew and I, this is our first year where we're not playing football. And how do you feel about that, Andrew? Um, it's one, it's, it's first off, we're leaving. My body feels great. Uh, it's at the same time. Now that football season's rolling around, I'm itching to get on the field. You are. Okay. Yeah. So in a, in a practice setting, not even the games, like I just want to go out there and goof around and try to make some interceptions, get my run fit going. Like it's just inside me. Like I'm, I, when I'm watching the preseason games, I'm still thinking power and force fit. Yeah. I'm always thinking power force fit. I'm always just thinking about my techniques, my chop, chop, rip, get around the corner you know, finishing position. There's all kinds of things that just run through my mind when I watch a football game that I just have so much passion behind. And not a lot of people have that. You know, not a lot of people outside of the St. Thomas football program. Like, I'm in my travel gear right now because this is a St. Thomas football podcast because because we have Glenn Caruso on our podcast. We spent 37 minutes with that man, and it was exhilarating, dude. Coach Glenn Caruso will be joining us in about 20 minutes on this very episode and I'm very excited for you guys to finally hear his message because we've been able to hear it for four years and it's been incredible and I'm very excited to share that with our marketing interns but before we do let's get to our first topic as it always is our average quality Mm. and this is kind of a little self-realization of what the average quality at its core really is and at times it's continuous improvement right it's something you don't do well at times and sometimes you're trying to do it better and this is the average quality but your average quality can be just generically something new like you're doing something for the first time and you realize wow i'm not that good at it yeah you're like the guinea pig in the situation and you're almost never going to do it the best right you're never gonna not fail in that situation and i think that's really what we unpacked last episode was holy shit like this is we encounter an average quality every time we throw ourselves at something and it doesn't work or it's something that we're, it's so foreign to us, something new, like you said. So it's super cool for us to like have that realization and now just, you know, kind of being aware of it and attacking it. And where did it become full circle? Well, when we were, while we were interviewing coach Glenn Caruso and uh, I was, I'm always in charge of setting up the, the, the video and the audio. That's my role. And I love doing it. However, I sometimes, find a way to mess it up and this time around I set up the the GoPro and a shot that captured coach and Declan and I just assumed I would be in the shot because it had the wide lens and I was right to the right of that well I didn't realize I didn't move my laptop over far enough and my entire everything is cut off but my nose and my knee it's the funniest thing ever dude I I was laughing when we saw that and I I had an idea because I was I was looking at the GoPro and I was like oh man this laptop's kind of right there but then I, I don't know, I didn't, being the small brain person that I am, like I didn't make any adjustments or uh, let you know. And I think the nerves just completely played when I tried to set up the YouTube or the GoPro. I was just not fully locked in. I wanted to get everything set up because I know he was pressing for time as he always is. He's very efficient and he just came off the scrimmage that ended up getting canceled short. They didn't get all their plays. So I was like, we need to make sure that we're just using this time wisely. And I didn't set it up properly. But we're not going to sell ourselves short here the gopro ran for the entire 37 minutes we got all the audio it sounds good andrew yes okay audio sounds, sounds great it sounds great and we're stoked for it. but before you know we get to the interview we wanted to kind of unpack or reflect on our experience four years in uh, at st thomas to going to school and playing football being student athletes but going through the program and kind of what it has created what it has manifest so andrew i'll start with you so really the only thing I've shared with you guys about my St. Thomas career is, well, actually I was high school. I was going to say like my first average quality was I'm 110 pounds or I'm 5'10", 170 pounds, and I had one interception in high school. And I think that type of uh, statistical achievement transferred into college. I ended up, Declan and I played at a, at a, in a program that was top 10, top 5, um, all four years. And that's awesome. Like we played it at the highest caliber level in division three. 
and I can hold my hat that I was on a, a team such as that. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to statistics, I didn't achieve as much as uh, one would think. I ended up starting zero games, and I, and I, my senior year, I finally got my shot on special teams after four years of trying to figure out how to make my name known uh, on the roster, and I, I earned that spot. Um, and it was a, it was a grind. The depth chart battle is an absolute grind. It's a mental toll. You're always thinking about how can I jump one spot in the depth chart? How can I pass this one person to get myself a little bit better of a chance? So like at times, like Jack Doomer was ahead of me a few times. So I was like, I don't really like Jack Doomer, but it just because of the depth chart. But when you get off the field, it's like, love Jack Doomer. Right. And uh, so the depth chart is, it's, it's a, it's, it builds anxiety for sure. But you got to understand that like, it's, it's a, if you want to be process oriented and that's ultimately what I wound up being through this process um, you have to trust your hard work day in, day out. You can't be expecting to just get those results right away. Yeah, it's all about not expecting that those results. You totally nailed it because if you look at those results, then you start to reflect and get down on yourself. Like, oh, man, freshman year just ended, and I didn't see the pl- field. I was last on the depth chart and just got my ass kicked on scout team. Like, yeah, that's the reality. And then when sophomore come, year comes around and they put someone – like a freshman, a really good freshman ahead of you, like that's not fun either. And then these these things start to build and build and build, and then you just start to look down on yourself, and you ultimately lose confidence. And the confidence is very, very key. For myself, you know, you, you mentioned statistics and like these numbers, and one I like, I think between the both of us, the most significant number is one. So for you, you had one touchdown. You had that one opportunity, you know, that's an Eminem song. For me, it was, I had one chance in football camp to go to camp for that senior year. That was my one opportunity that I ever had. I mean, I had other opportunities, but I guess the, what I really like to point out is like, I wasn't invited to camp. I wasn't, I wasn't evaluated as a top, I forget how many players, but I wasn't in the top five of the depth chart for my first three years. And that's not easy to go through. That's not something that's, um, you know, rewarding or something that makes you want to come back. But the and because of that, I think a lot of people that maybe loosely followed me or maybe some fans would look at my career as a failure because I never started. I only had a few tackles total in my entire career, and I only made only one. I only had one appearance. Um, on the official roster my senior year. But what I took away from this program in terms of confidence and in terms of battling anything, like literally anything, dude, I all fucking run through a brick wall. Like I'll make it happen. And the football career, like my four years uh, prepared me for that. It, nothing, uh, no, no one else has gone through that kind of situation and I've leveraged it tenfold into what I do now. I think that's exactly it. You've, you've taken what you've learned. You haven't just, you did it and then you moved on to the next thing. You've taken, we've tried to take every single thing we've learned in that St. Thomas football program and transfer it into the back pocket, our daily life, our personal life. Um, and I think it, it also revolves around the idea that we weren't necessarily given um, performance bonuses right. along the way. Right. Um, maybe at times we saw a little bit. However, the majority of it was the personal willpower to move forward and never accept or settle for what the position you are in currently. Granted, you you do that role to the best of your ability. Whatever position you were in, if you were fifth on the depth chart or you were third on the depth chart or you, or you got a shot in special teams or you were only a scout team player, you took that at, at opportunity to be the best version of yourself continuously. Yeah. And, but you never were like, I'm fine with this. Right. No, yeah. It was always like... That was the thing, too, for me is, like, I never lost confidence in my ability to play. Like, I always told myself, like, you know what? I actually can play here. And you know what? Some some of these opportunities don't necessarily work in your favor. And it's not – I never took that as a, a burden. Like, I never – I would never hate Coach K, my position coach, the defensive coordinator, like, one of the most badass dudes. I would have never – I would have never hated him for not giving me an opportunity. I would never hate Coach Caruso for never, you know, showing me appreciation or gratitude for – something that I did in the scout team or even on the field. Like I would never hate them for never getting that gratitude because what they gave me in return in terms of, you know, my confidence in myself to conquer anything, 
the life lessons of the obstacles, the way, and just always being high energy, the, those things are so much more worth it than saying, hey, nice tackle, or hey, I'd like to promote you to third string or second string. So Yeah, and, and it also, again, like the small details that program preaches yeah. of just being uh, aware and recognize them and try to do those as effectively as you can, that has been something we continue to strive for. We try to look into every little detail that we can become better at. And that's where the average quality kind of has roots as well because we're like, oh, wow, we didn't do that that well. And it was very minute. However, we want to be better at that. And it's not very impactful in the grand scheme of things, but we can just be better at it than the next person or the next time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look for those small incremental details. Yeah, and it's like you you obsess over it almost. Like a lot of people would, you know, screw up on these certain things and kind of just put it put it away and not worry about it. But you and I would attack it every single time. And we've just gotten in this routine of constantly attacking what we suck at. And now it's like, oh, we're eliminating those things. Like they don't come back up. Like you're not going to set up the GoPro and have a bad angle again. Like that will never happen again. I can confidently say that. Like those are situations that are one-time things, which is another great lesson from football in general is like you never make the same mistake twice because if you do then you just lost trust in almost everybody or from everybody if you don't force to uh, force a, a power coming your way andrew and he gets outside then the outside linebacker is going to overcompensate and not do his job and then di- cre- it creates distrust exactly and that's what we talked about in the process oriented podcast i was detailing how you have to do your role no yeah. matter how crazy you want to, you want to make that play you have to do your role before that whether it's being a scout team player and giving your receivers the best look they can possibly do or it's on special teams and you're not going to make that tackle on kickoff but you're going to stay in your lane and you're going to make sure the ball stays inside you and allow the other five guys or eight ten guys whoever's in that area to make that tackle and that team aspect of St. Thomas the togetherness the community that it, it um, offers is something that I want again. And I think the back pocket is is starting to build that way with our listeners. Granted, we don't have like 140 million um, staff members. Oh, sure, sure. Around like players and coaches and trainers. Um, You're saying like the all-inclusive makeup of the back pocket? Of Saint, what St. Saint Thomas had. Oh, gotcha. They had 140 people together at, at one time. Mm-hmm. And we all had that same mindset. We were all bought into this program. And... That togetherness is so unique because not many people can be that bought into one thing and be that willing to give their effort in a, in a selfless manner like the players of St. Thomas. Yeah, and I would even say the leader of that group of men and women, obviously, but just being able to handle that and instill a culture that does exactly what you aim to do. You know, all the things that we've been talking about None of it's really instilled. None of it really manifests without Coach Caruso. Exactly. And, and I'm not saying that I was perfect at being selfless all the time or I was perfect at making sure that I wasn't being um, complacent or like accepting my role. Like at times it felt it was very hard. Those four years, were they were very hard. But I am so happy I took the worthy path of, of going the length to finish my football career at St. Thomas. And... That is, at the end of the day, another thing that I just really do tip my hat towards is I completed my four years and I gave everything I had. I know that for a fact. Yeah, I can echo the same exact thing. I I never considered quitting, but if I, looking back at it or looking at the situations that I was faced with and being, you know, and wanting to, you know, look at a, a different path, like, oh, what would happen if I were to just hang it up tomorrow? I think like the regret that I would have um, had to deal with would have just been horrible and it would have just hurt me physically. And so, you know, holding on to that and just always turning anything that I had into a positive really helped me get through those four years and uh, it, best decision I ever made. Absolutely. And Coach Caruso was the leader of this program yeah. and still is still is. For our four years, he was, and now he's, st- and he continues to be. Um, I'm very thankful. I had an opportunity to play under Coach Caruso. Yeah, and I could say the same thing. I'm thankful that we were able to get him on the podcast. Like that was our next step, man, and we did it. Yeah, was that stoked. was an eight month process. Yeah, um, from 
January, with well, since we ended football, we've been trying to arrange a time in our busy schedules through school. Thought the end of the last uh, fall semester or spring semester, um, it was difficult with um, us finishing school and him having spring ball and then a, a tour abroad for the football program. And then the summer rolled around, and again we had work, so then we couldn't work and we couldn't meet with him for a while. And we outlined this in the podcast how difficult it was. But then we finally got 30 minutes during camp. He took time out of his day to meet with us during probably the busiest time of year for him. That speaks volumes towards me. I am so, I, I, I think I said, I know I said thank you a thousand times during the interview, but I want to say it again. Thank you, Coach Crusoe, for taking time out of your day. It means a lot. And those 37 minutes of having that human connection with you over the podcast and having the opportunity to record it was remarkable. Yes, thank you. I can, we cannot echo the gratitude enough. One thing that you guys should know is, you know, he's he's always mentally locked in on trying to better himself at everything he does. So he's either bettering himself with his family, he's bettering himself with this for this team, uh, bettering himself, you know, just mentally, physically, and he'll always vocalize that with, with the team and anyone who really asks, to be honest. But having him able just to sit down for 30 minutes and just really get a conversation and that full-on reflection was one of the most like innate opportunities and it was just so cool to be able to really unravel and see what goes on in the makeup of coach caruso absolutely i think is it time to roll the it's interview time, dude. let's do it marketing interns lock in 37 minutes live of, in the moment dude. live in the moment appreciate it enjoy Welcome, Coach Glenn Caruso, to the Back Pocket Podcast. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. I'm happy to be here. It's been a process just trying to get on this and coordinate schedules, but really excited about what you guys are doing. Yes, it's been a process. And when uh, when you said you wanted you had time during camp, that kind of took me off because I was like, all right, we didn't get him during the summer, and I feel like that was the down period when we could have got him on. And then you saw Declan in the weight room, and it was like snowball effect. We booked a time, so... I'm super excited. Well, you know, there's never a great time to do anything, but like everyone says, if you want to get something done, give it to the guy who's the busiest. Usually they'll find a way, and you guys are great examples of that, mm-hmm. so thank you. I also think, like, the work that has been put in for this 30 minutes of our of your time today has been extraordinary. Okay. If you think about when we gra- or when we finished playing football, we hit, we hit you up for an interview in February. Mm-hmm. We were booking something in May- March right. of 2018, right. got pushed to April, then it was like, okay, Italy trips coming up with spring ball. Let's push it after that in the summer, yeah, like in Andrew June, said. And all, yeah, in June, and mm-hmm. then it's like, okay, we have full time jobs. You have a full time job, but you want to go home and see your family after football. That's right. mm-hmm. And then the the only time we were really able to coordinate and get something set in stone was me showing up to school to the workout and just being fortunate to see you. Well, so it's awesome. We're here now, so let's be in the moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. So first question, and this is a question we ask all of our guests, and it's been taken in a multitude of ways. Is what is your average quality? Uh, I probably have a lot of them, but I would say the one that I need to work on the most or to focus on the most is just what we talked about is being in the moment. You know, I'm a very forward thinking guy and always want to try and, you know, we've been together for years and, you know, we're always trying to build and get better and improve ourselves. And I think um, one of my big flaws, I, I do okay at times, but I fail at more than I'm succeeding at is just being in the moment and enjoying this moment for what it is. And we work hard on it. Um, I think calling it out is certainly one way to identify that you have to be better at it and just keeping it on your mind. But even things like um, just uh, mental digestion of the day or, or meditation or things that we're trying to work on. But I'm not great at it, and I'd like to be better at it. Um, but it's part of who I am. It's been very, that's another thing that's difficult to do is stay in the moment, especially with a lot of things pulling you in different directions. Um, For us, it's been a unique process to stay in the moment with the podcast and forward think when people are always questioning, like, how are you making money? And how are, what is this next step for you? And we have been really fortunate to have each other in this situation and take that relationship and be like, okay, we can build and grow. Um, But we have to focus on what needs to be accomplished right now. And Again, verbalizing that goes a long way, and I think our marketing interns, our listeners, have found that draw and being connected to us and found an audience, and we found that audience by doing such things like that. Well, certainly humbling to be able to admit that you have average qualities, right? And that's something that a lot of people, especially in social media, don't take the time to do. We put out there what we perceive to be the best of what we want 
to be out there and something like that allows you to open up a legitimate dialogue. But more importantly, I guess, sometimes I think perception and reality sometimes get a, gets a little skewed. What would you say is my average quality, either one of you, things that I need to work on? Mm. I think when we were going through the football season, um, it was always, you, you've been always open and available, which has been phenomenal. Um, and I think you've been awesome at allowing yourself to be open. It's been, for me, it's been difficult to approach you, I'd say, personal, from a personal standpoint, because um, the, the level I've always sought you as, and then this, being in this situation, um, the first thinking, the homie situation when we talked to you with sure, that, absolutely. that was kind of the first conversation I felt like I had with you in regards to not football oriented um, and more about kind of something we wanted to offer, which was really cool. And that kind of helped grow my relationship with you and see you outside that light. And then working this eight, nine months, like we kind of organized in this beginning of the conversation to have you on this podcast, I was like, this is going to be awesome because I'll finally have 30 minutes of his time to communicate and just talk about whatever. Well, let me take you back to a conversation that happened about two months before that homie conversation, which is when you sit in that, sat in that chair over there and you wanted to talk about the possibility of looking into getting into the sports field That's correct. in a different realm. And I remember you said something specifically that has always stuck with me. And it's, um, I don't want to just ask you for help with a contact. I want to prove to you that I've earned the right to be able to get your recommendation. And I always thought that that was very Im- in a very impressive way to approach someone when you're looking for assistance because everyone's going to want to sit down in the chair and say, hey, can you help me with this? But you specifically wanted to let me know that you were working very, very hard to earn that, that right, and that meant the world to me. How about you? What do I need to do better, Jack? You know, I was thinking the Don't other be day. be bashful, man. Right? No, 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 no. Cause, so Andrew went deep, right? I'm going to go a little surface level. Fair enough. <laughs> so I think if you got some personalized Glenn Caruso shoes, and I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not saying like get the nice $120 support your feet. Like that's not you, right? Oh, no, it's not. Air Monarchs. Okay. Some white and maybe purple. I don't know what your color scheme is. Maybe black. Okay. Some Air Monarchs. I will have you know my track record with trendy things does not look good on Glenn Caruso. And this is... It well, does, and I can't Google, pull it off. Google Air, Air Monarchs, and this will be your shoe. Okay. I promise you. They are overlooked in the, in, in the realm of 20 to 30. They are capitalized from 30 to 50. And I think you've, you're, you're, it's perfect for you. You nailed it. I'm poor fashion, and I certainly need to work on that. That's so. awesome. What else is on your mind? Um, so kind of helping our marketing interns who don't know you specifically okay. have a little background. Got so it. if you could briefly describe how you became a St. Thomas coach and a little backstory of yourself. So I grew up uh, in Connecticut, about uh, 15 miles outside of New York City. and went to school in upstate New York at a school called Ithaca. In some ways, similar to this, Division Three private school, uh, really good academics, really good athletics, and when I was there, it didn't feel like you had to marginalize or mitigate one for the other. They wanted to be great in both, and that's the thing that drew me uh, to St. Thomas. It's drawn me to football ever since I was nine years old, and I picked the team that I was going to be on when I was nine years old for that same reason. I wanted to be well-rounded and great at a lot of different things, not just one thing. So I went there, and I went to school to be a lawyer. Um, my dad, most amazing person by far, not even close, that I ever met. Um, when my mom died and, and he was, I was eight years old, he moved his practice into the house to raise his family. Best move I've ever seen in my life, and I think that's part and parcel of why we've decided to make our stand here at St. Thomas. And um, are there other places out there that might be fancier? Sure, uh, there, there might be, I don't know. But I do know the paradox of choice, if I'm not careful enough, would force me to always think about what else is out there instead of what we talked about at the beginning, being in the moment and, and finding St. Thomas was a blessing. So um, as I thought I was going to law school, Dad kind of took me by the the hand and said, what are you doing? And I was a senior in high school. Matter of fact, it was uh, the same day. It was after this. This was uh, after my yes. very last game. And yeah, that's not exactly a flattering picture, but that's that's me at 272 pounds. Doesn't look good on a 5'9 frame. <laughs> and um, that night he said, look, here's the deal. He said, I went into the law because I was in love with the law. My father was the first in his family to ever go to school, not a college, not a high school, literally into a school. And his father came over uh, when he was in, about 10 years old uh, on a boat from Naples. 
and my dad put himself through through school and law school. And he said, I'm passionate about the law. He said, I love it. I get up at 630 every day and I'm ready for my feet to hit the ground and go. He said, you're different. You're, uh, you know, you're a little strange. You like sports. We were not necessarily an athletic family. Uh, we, we all played sports, but it wasn't a high athletic family. At least I wasn't a great athlete. And, um, and he said, what you are in love with is cultures and developing people and maximizing the abilities of groups to be together. You love football. He said, what I think you should do is get in your little Volkswagen and go as far away from here as you possibly can and figure out who you are. You can always come home. And I was 22 years old. And, you know, to be able to be blessed to have a father who could see that for me when I couldn't see it for myself and be willing. I mean, how many guys are going to say, don't go to law school? Go take a job for two hundred and forty dollars a month, you know, and, and um, so that's what I did. I got in my Volkswagen, and if you put all of our towns in the United States on a continuum, the opposite of Greenwich, Connecticut, is Fargo, North Dakota, and that's where my Volkswagen ended up. And I was there for seven years, had an awesome time at NDSU, learned so much from some amazing guys, had a blast coaching there, and met Rachel, as you guys know, Rachel, and uh, and that's when we decided that we were gonna make our stand in the Midwest and. Uh, was at South Dakota for a while, and then we had Anna, and Anna was our oldest 14 years ago. Um, Rachel was in the, the hospital room, and then all these little different crossroads, right? I mean, all these little, I, I'm just very fortunate that I could pick out and say that was an important crossroad, and that was an important crossroad, and that. And as Anna was born, we decided that we wanted to, to be in an area more like this. And uh, so we, in the hospital that night, drew three circles. Um, on a map and one of those circles was uh, the Twin Cities and we said we have one year uh, I'd like to get a job in coaching but if I can I'll go into real estate or I'll be a janitor or I'll be a speaker or marketing or whatever it, I, I had to do and we we're fortunate enough to find a job down the road at McAllister um, and uh, was a pretty perfect first head coaching job for me because there was so much work that had to be done there. Our first team meeting, Coach Walsh and I were in our first team meeting and there were 23 people in that room and we were taking over a senior class that was 1 in 29 mm. and it was just like the best experiment for me to be able to get into it and learn what I needed to do to maximize and you know this is a totally different school there's a lot of um a lot of things that are moving in the right direction in order for us to be good you know that the confluence is a huge part of it but i think that one of the things that allowed us to be good here is that we came from a place that didn't have all of those same things in alignment so it really forced us to be intentional and diligent with all of our placement with personnel placement with resource placement with recruiting placement with all of it and then we were able to cut our teeth, so to speak, on that job. And then you take the job here, and, and certainly it's been a, a heck of a decade and, uh, and a lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you. One thing that I really want to tap into, and you brought it up perfectly in the average quality, and it was your self-awareness, this mindset of how can I get better. And you, you're open with that with the Very team. Very much so. And I just want to tap into that a little bit and understand, you know, where did this come from? And how do you leverage what you've learned and then apply that to your profession, which is being a coach? Well, we've always been taught from a young age. When I say we, I mean the, the, the Caruso kids. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of kids that are, that are you know, born on third base and hit a single and think they hit a home run, right? And, and it's, it's really not the things that have been bestowed upon you because those are the work and efforts of someone else. Um, but it's can you become the best version of you as possible and the only way I can do that I mean I, I am very aware very aware of who I am and who I am not and I know I have some good qualities but I also know I'm not fancy I'm not flashy I know I'm not the smartest guy in the room I know that for a fact I know I'm not the uh, you know best looking guy maybe the, the the best speaker whatever it is but I do know for a fact that I will work um, just about harder than anybody to try and just get a teeny tiny bit better every day. And it's kind of tough now. I, I, ha I have a tough time reconciling your generation. You know, I'm 44, you guys are 22, we're not in the same generation. And people nowadays seem to be attracted to the superlatives, the biggest, the fastest, the, these huge jumps, these big sweeping things that attract the eye. You know, if you can't do it in YouTube in 15 seconds and someone's going to make another click or, you know, you're, you're going to lose your, your audience. 
And I think what's missing in that is the proverbial war of attrition of that all I want to do is just get just a teeny bit better. And if I could be a tenth of a percent better every single day over time, um, I'll be in a good spot. You know, I don't think that's indigenous to human growth. I think it's it's anything. You look at cultures. We took a trip to to Italy a couple of years ago, and that was an amazing experience. And you, you look at a Roman Empire and the rise and the fall of that empire and you look at um, how it was done in small little batches while it still retains core qualities over a long period of time and sometimes much like that empire that we learned when you get too big and you over leverage and sometimes lose some of those core qualities is where the downfall starts to begin or you can talk to uh, Warren Buffett not like I've ever talked to Warren Buffett but I've listened to him talk on TV and he says you know you want to you want to make money invest in the stock market invest in America and do it over a long period of time and don't expect it to happen quickly and I I think that's just a really good mantra for personal growth as well Um, and I, I don't think there's anything cooler than a guy or a girl imagining or explaining that um, you got a lot of work to do. Like, I think that's the coolest thing. Just just being as, as open as you can to say, man, I fail. I failed today miserably. I'm going to fail again tomorrow, but I'm probably not going to make the same mistake twice. And so if you look at it that way, then everything that happens to you is good because it gives you that stepping stone. Mm-hmm. And it's just kind of the way we approach it. So. Yep. And there's so much in there. And one of the things I, I want to talk about right away is so – St. Thomas football, mm-hmm. Declan and I came in, we had those expectations of, um, statistical expectations probably, that we um, didn't realize this program, uh, mm-hmm. outside of that this program, um, which your goals really should be. So initially we were goals of being a starter, um, interceptions, tackles, sure. all of that. Um, tangibles. Tangibles, yep. exactly. Um, and I think Declan and I gravito- gravitated close to each other sophomore year when we recognized that if we want to stay in this program, that necessarily can't be the case. It, it can still be there, but that should not be where our focus lies. And it's been in personal growth and kind of figuring out where we fit and growing in that manner. Um, always looking for opportunities to just be the best you can be, like you've mentioned in the, uh, in so far. That has been on the forefront of our football career. And we started at the bottom, and we, nef- we necessarily didn't make it to the top, quote-unquote, tangibly. But we made it to the top intangibly with relationships and interpersonal um, communication skills or interpersonal emotional skills. Um, so then taking that and having the ability to apply it into this podcast right now has been one of the coolest things. We've been doing it for 19 months, and we had no idea how to start something like this. We just wanted to be in front of a microphone and talk to our friends and record it. Then it turned into talking to professors and having intellectual conversations where they're teaching us some really cool things. And then at this whole time, we're recording it and we're sharing it to an audience. That was really powerful to us. And we're like, okay, who else can we tap into? And we use social media, LinkedIn, um, Instagram to reach out to entrepreneurs or someone that's doing something really cool and talking to them. And we've grown a brand of um, belief that we are committed to unlock how every person has an innate ability to be an entrepreneur, a motivator, an influencer in some way, shape, or form, whether they're starting a business or they're a low man on the totem pole in their company or they're in sports, anything of that sort, they can influence someone. They can motivate themselves Mm -hmm. and they can start some sort of shaping a business in their own personal life. And I think it's you look at the three of us, I mean, let's be really honest, we're all kind of the same person athletically. None of us are very... We're not very good, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we work tremendously hard to get the most out of us, but we're not the one that came out of high school with a, a four-star rating or anything like that. And although people are always looking for talent that is quantifiable, the great organizations, uh, cultures, businesses, teams, whatever you want, is whatever medium you're using – are loaded with Declans and Andrews and Glens and guys that um, will sometimes, when you have a lot of those talents, um, you don't learn how to cultivate that intuition. Uh, the three of us were not going to make a lot of tackles in college just by our speed, right? We weren't. So you have to learn how to cultivate those other things. And I think a lot of times people don't pay attention to their shortcomings quite often being... Um, something that can move them forward. And 
specifically to your point in this podcast over the last 19 months, I think a lot of guys would not have the, the vision to just say, let's just start it. You know, let's just do something. Quite often we, we want to go down a path of a quid pro quo of, okay, I'll go down this path, but I need to know that at the end of it, I get my salary, I get my six weeks vacation, I get my name in the newspaper, and life doesn't happen that way. You know, I was reading this, this book, The God Never Blinks book, and, uh, you know, Rachel has cancer right now, and we're dealing with that. You just saw Rachel, and that's great. And, and there's so many really, really good lessons in here. But lesson number two, which is exactly what you, were, you guys were saying, uh, when in doubt, just take the next right step. We don't always have things storyboarded out for the next 40 years. So a lot of people are not comfortable just taking a step. And that's what you guys did. Just take a step, and then I'll figure out, I'll fail, I won't do that one again, and then I'll just take another right step as long as you know the steps are moving in the right direction, and that's why I'm real proud of what you guys are doing. Thank one you. of the many reasons why I'm proud of what you guys are doing. Thank you. And I think us being able to put that on a platform to show that progression and to show each step that we took, you know, it's a lot of it's comical, which is why we're yeah, the comedy it. podcast, and I think that's great. Mm-hmm. But we would have never done it unless, you know, the Simon Sinek, what's your why, what's your right? Mind, yeah. You always roll back to that. But... Also, just the process. And I, we had debate. We actually debated process versus results um, with on um, one of our previous podcasts. And what we found Who was, was that with that was with our roommate Matt Heron, good uh, friend. Yep. Process versus results. What we kind of unpacked through this hour what was was we found that the process is great when you don't have the res, uh, that that tangible result at the end of the tunnel. Andrew and I, when people ask us, what are you going to do with this podcast? We do not have can't that tell answer. You. We yeah, can't tell you that answer. Mm-hmm. But it's grown into something already through this nine month, 19 months that we've ne- we never would have imagined. But our process has been fine-tuned and cultivated each step of the way. And that's why we love the process. Well, and I would even argue I am the least results-oriented person that I know that is decent at what he does in our sport. I do not... I am not a results or stats guy. Um, Now, a lot of people are going to say, you're full of it. That's that's a smokescreen and you're sandbagging, and I'm not. Now, I'm not going to negate that we've had our fair share of success and probably more than our fair share of successes around here, but I think that's because that's the byproduct of working on the process. And to just add one more thing, it's not just focusing on the process because you don't have the results, because someday we all are going to have some results if we follow the process well. It's, I, you, still, you still get the results, but we don't make that. That's not what you lead with. That's not what's the most important thing to you. But I am a big believer that I, I could certainly debate, even with your roommate, I think pretty well, that even if you were decidedly results-oriented and you wanted better results that you'd still be in a better situation if you focused on the process. That's my belief. And it, that's not going to change until I die, there's no doubt. Absolutely. And I think that was another thing. Going through that hour was cool to hear what he was saying and how firm he was in, but at the end of the day we were like, we came to the conclusion, yeah, there's bits and pieces from both, so it's just really where you predominantly lie um, from a time being. But you're always going to have some type of result orientation, whether it's 10%, whether it's 50%. It will be in there. Um, it's just how are you going to look at the very fine-tuned craft. Um, and that's when we it illuminated in us that it was 100% um, being a process orientation. Um, but something else that you were talking about when you went through your journey, you are kind of talking about the difference in age. So we're definitely not in the same generation, and you kind of talked about the differences from your perspective. One thing that we've noticed um, dealing with this generation, trying to market to them, there are people right now that are influencing us significantly, such as Gary Vaynerchuk, who's an entrepreneur and a person that is preaching humility and gratitude. And he is someone that has done it to the highest level in his field right now, um, which is a media company. And so he's all over the social media platforms, really targeting um, our generation. And he, he said, my goal at the end of my career is not to have, not to be the Jeff Bezos or the um, Steve Jobs, where sure. I've made the most money, but it's going to be that I have changed how entrepreneurs think. They're not going to be thinking of the, that monetization, the money aspect of I need to make the most money, but they're going to look at this as a way that they're going to be thankful and grateful for every opportunity they had, and they're going to give back, and it's going to influence 
all of society. And that's his goal. And, and we follow him and listen to him almost daily to keep that inspiration that's going. That's as honorable as it gets right there. Mm-hmm. I mean, how can, you, how can you think that there's any sort of leadership that's better than, than leaving some sort of legacy? And I get that that's a term that a lot of people think different things about. But um, it, it, if you really look at it, I, I understand that we, everyone wants to have a certain quality of life. I get that. Um, but I also understand that um, when you chase a goal that is an inverted U hypothesis, um, it can be tricky. So, for instance, we talk about anxiety when we're in the football program, right? Inverted U hypothesis is a bell-shaped curve, right? So if you graft something out, there is certainly a point where um, too little anxiety, you know, you, you can't be sleeping in the locker room before a game and be at your best, Right. But you also can't be bouncing off the walls because you're going to be on the downside of that. There's a zone in there. And most things in life, I think, fall on the inverted U hypothesis. And I would argue that money is one of those. Certainly, um, there is such a thing as having too little money. And we understand the stressors and the anxiety that that causes. But I would also argue that there's such a thing as having too much money. And if you don't want to pay attention to me, then you can just go look at any of the studies of happiness of people that won the lottery. And um, you can pretty much figure out that if that's all you're chasing, I mean, our goal is to find something in life, in my opinion, that has a straight upward trajectory along a graph. And um, money is is a very difficult way, I think, to quantify um, what one's legacy is going to be, whereas his, his legacy that he's leaving behind, one of humility and growth and learning and changing the way that people think, that's always the most difficult of legacies to leave behind. Absolutely. And another thing, too, is, you know, when you talk about the failure, right, everything that is going through the, this day-to-day life is always a constant failure, which is why the average quality is great, and which is why your mindset of just, you know, loving failure and just getting ready for that opportunity. We ask this question, what is in your back pocket? So when fit you fail, pressure becomes stress. Oh, yeah. You're in this mentally where you have to be mentally strong. What do you, what are these, what qualities do you rely on to conquer that moment? It's my back pocket quality as a person. That's my dad. I mean, I, whether, whether he's physically with us or not, and he's not, he passed away 13 years ago now, but by far my, uh, raising however you want to put it whether it's him uh, or my family uh, or our, our circumstances in which we grew up that's what I routinely go back to to try and quell that that stress when it when it comes on and look I'm not not perfect I, I don't do that uh, at the highest of levels but I think I always think back to um, am I making decisions um, for the right reasons based on how I was raised and I, maybe I would not be able to say that if I was raised another way. I don't know. I only know how I was raised. And my dad raised me with a certain level of expectation that had very little to do with society's expectations. The Caruso expectations were, were pretty high of themselves. And um, that's, that's what's in my back pocket. And the great thing is, you know, my dad didn't, my dad didn't tell us how to grow up. He said, I'm going to be a man. I'm going to let you watch. And you're welcome, by the way. That's sort of the way he... He went about it, and I always tell people, you know, you talk about leaving a legacy, or I'm talking about leaving a legacy. Um, He prepared us for the time when he wasn't going to be here, which really is the way that we try and prepare our guys in the program. I, I really want you to make the right call when you're out there defensively, but I'm not out there making the call for you. And you know what? Even after that's done for for four years here, you're going to be out in society, and I'm not going to be necessarily in your back pocket when you're in that interview. And hopefully we've laid an educational foundation, a part of an educational foundation, so that you can draw from that. But without a doubt, it goes back to the work ethic that, that my dad and our family instilled in myself and all my brothers and sisters. And um, if I could be... If I could be half the father that my dad was to us, I'd consider myself very successful. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And I think, well, I mean, family, of course. Uh, my parents, I know Declan can definitely say the same thing, extremely influential mm-hmm. and shaping who I am today. My dad, my mom, my brothers. Um, it's been an awesome journey. I'm so thankful to have them. And it's also really cool of all the other people involved that I have in my back pocket, and such as yourself and the, the um, things that you've instilled me over these four years. <coughs> extremely grateful. And that's helped me go through my day-to-day routine of just 
the, again, we're going to talk about this a lot, but the failure aspect, not looking at it as a failure, but as an opportunity to grow. Yeah, the outcome that you, de you definitely didn't intend, but that's okay. How are you going to fix that? What are you going to learn from it? Um, and all these people that we've talked to on the podcast, uh, they've, we've asked these same questions that we're asking you, and everyone takes it a different way, and you're always learning, and that's another thing. Like Learning and listening has been a huge key core principle of the back pocket. Uh, we're not, like you've said it again, you're not perfect. We are not perfect. And we love saying that we're fully transparent with that regard cool. when we're ready to learn. And we want someone to just share their story because there's so much in there and so much to unpack. And it's bummer that some we have 30 minutes, some we can talk to for an hour and a half. And with you, it's only 30 minutes. So we have, we'll keep it short and well, maybe we'll to the point. One. Exactly. <laughs> there's always another opportunity. But there, there definitely is a difference. I always uh, get a kick out of people that are listening versus people that are waiting for their turn to talk and there's a big difference between that and you know as my dad used to say you know Lord gave you two ears and one mouth so you listen twice as much as you speak and even if you just wanted mm -hmm. to not take that you know theoretically but just if you wanted to take it very literally what can really be learned when you're speaking right I mean you can really only learn I'm not when I speak I'm not I'm not necessarily learning I'm giving my time and my whatever I have to give to someone else, but until you can listen to someone, which is a quality that is becoming um, more and more difficult, I think, to find because the noise that is out there now is much like everyone automatically being a third child. When I'm the third child, I, I had to be louder. I had to be more bold and boisterous because if I wasn't, nothing got heard, right? <laughs> But you still don't want to give up the opportunity to, to learn from the people that have come before you and to, to listen to them. But I don't know. I don't think that's a high priority in a lot of people's thought process nowadays. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to uphold. What's cool to, uh, you know, interviewing you now, it's really hit me full on. Like when Andrew and I started this, we, like Andrew referred to how we just didn't know how to do anything. But what we did know how to do was to attack it as if a St. Thomas football player would attack a podcast. Amen. And that's literally what we've done, and much gratitude to you for instilling that into us and to rely on every quality that we've pretty much talked to thus far. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, really cool to sit here and, you know, be in the moment and have this conversation and recognize, like, wow, this is just, this is the back pocket right here. Uh, <laughs> this is a funnel. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I will say it, that that learning goes both ways because I think everybody looks at the teacher and the student in the same way they look at the coach and the player or the father and the son or you know, the mom and the, the daughter and they think that that growth only goes one way and that comes back to us in this manner and in other manners more than we probably deserve but it it's symbiotic so I can tell you that what I've learned from your humility and how you handle your profession or your humility and how you always put the team first or the people in your lives that have become people in our lives. I can't tell you how many times I've had a rough day and like magic, a, a text pops up with a message from John and Sarah, you know, and so it's, <laughs> it's amazing at how when I know it, I get it, it's, it's, it's mushy and it's trite, but when you give and you open yourself up, it's not just a one-way street selfishly. I get to learn a lot from the people that we get to work with and coach, and you two are not just an exce no exception to that. You, you guys are at the top of the ladder, so thank you. Absolutely. Thank you again. Um, and this brings us to my final, our final question, Shoot. which is, um, what did you learn today from the time that you woke up? You Do we want to ask we, yeah, two final questions? Sure. Okay. Go with the first one. Yeah. So the first final question okay. is, do you have any questions for us? Well, I already asked the most important one, so you always lead off with the most important question in your podcast, and we develop it from there. So the, the question I had was, what do you think my uh, average quality is? So that's, uh, I, I got mine out there without you even asking. Perfect. Um, I would say, um, what, has, what has taken you in a direction that you didn't expect in the last 30 minutes? What is something that has been a surprise to you that you did not expect coming in here? I did not know you wanted to be a lawyer. Very good. Yeah. And I didn't necessarily want to be a lawyer. I just wanted to be whatever my dad was, and he happened to be a lawyer. If he was a janitor, I would want to be a janitor. So let me put that in perspective. Mm -hmm. How about you, Andrew? Uh, for me, it was <laughs> kind of naive to me, I think, but I was like, all right, we're going to come in here. The scrimmage is going to be over. He's gonna be, it's going to be a time down. But um, when I walked in, you came, you came in, Coach Crusoe, 
and your family was here and you had another person sitting there. I mean, it just always continues to surprise me how much you take on and how much you're ready to uphold and uh, uh, continue to move forward with that. And uh, we were having a conversation with Mrs. Caruso about different things that have been played into your uh, your life and everyone's life and um, how proud of the programs you've built and how we continue to talk with you and have these 30 minute conversations. Um, So it was really cool. That's something I didn't expect. And uh, again, those are another things that I'm very thankful and grateful for. I appreciate it. What's the last question? The last question is, what did you learn today from the moment you woke up to right now when we're having this conversation? Well, uh, I'm maybe not always the most approachable person, and I need to find out what monarchs are. Those are the two things that I learned today, or I will learn today before I go to sleep, and I appreciate you for those. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just today really allowed me to think about um, you, you met a friend of my wife's out there who was waiting. Her name is Shannon. And, uh, and we have a, a saying um, that goes back to a funny story 15 years ago. But it's, it's the saying is, you know, it's all good. And it's all good is exactly what we go through every day. So to your point, what you have drilled home is um, the ability to risk appropriate levels and be willing to listen and fail and then to grow from those failures. And I think to, you know, what we're going through right now, we've talked about uh, my wife, we've talked about my father and, and our family situation. And, you know, I just go back now that I'm talking to you guys and I think when my mom passed away on Christmas Day when I was eight, that was tough, man. And although I wouldn't go back and wish it on an eight-year-old Glenn Caruso, there are certainly benefits that came out of that. I wouldn't go back and take that path again if it was offered to me a different way. But since it happened, I know that we're better for it. Rachel has stage 3 colon cancer that we're working through right now. And although I wouldn't go back to the 17th of November and wish that that happened on the Caruso's again, I also wouldn't wish it away. And maybe it's... Maybe it's easy for me to say because she's alive and she's healthy and we're moving on the road to recovery. Maybe maybe that is. But I also know that there are things that came out of it. And so if I could take some of the most devastating things that ever happened in my life and look back after a period of time and say, you know what, it wasn't the most enjoyable thing, but we're better for it. It's just a great reminder to me from listening to you guys that it is all good. And if we're willing to approach it with a positive attitude, not rose-colored glasses, but with a positive attitude, knowing that we're going to fail, then, I mean, why can't we enjoy all of it, the good and the bad? Awesome. Awesome. Guys, thanks so much. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate it. And that was our interview with Coach Caruso. Thank you. Again, I'm going to continue to say thank you for taking the time during the most busy time for you and sitting down with us the back pocket how cool is that yeah and you said the back pocket and that was like the plot twist like 90 percent into the interview it was i had this like realization where it was man the back pocket is really andrew myself and coach caruso like this he you know made this he created this mindset that we both have and we've done i would say a pretty good job of sharing that on this platform. Yes, we've we've translated into our version of a couple ordinary average guys with extraordinary passions, but the roots remain of coach Caruso-isms. Yeah. And of like the we don't complain, we don't get embarrassed. Like we we're willing to put on content that we don't feel 100% comfortable with because we know it's authentic and it's got a good message even though we're being a bunch of goofballs. Like that's fine with us. We yeah. love that. Absolutely. We have no problems and I think that or no problem with it. And I think that whole makeup is the back pocket mantra. Like when we talk about the mantra, it's all those things that St. Thomas football also stood for. And I think a lot of people who were in the program could really see that. So it was really cool to like, just connect the dots with him being there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But here we're on the back end. We're in the moment still. We haven't deviated from the moment and we're in the back end, dude, and we're I'm, I'm stoked about it. I love the back end. It's so different than the front in the interview. I mean, we get to do whatever we want on the back end, but it always stays consistent with what did you learn in a feel-good story. Like, what the topics we discuss don't need to be directly related towards our title or our um, description. It's completely separate from that. It's personal, and I love that. It's the dark side of the moon, bro. It's, it's fun as hell back here. We just kind of screw around. You know, have a good time, but we got a format. You know, we have we have a what do we learn to feel good story, and I'll start. Please Is that do. Cool? Please do. Usually, 
But it's cool for me. We alternate. Okay. You, I think you just lead me in. I, I yeah. have no expectations of starting, but you just always lead me in. Okay. But go ahead. Back end. Thank Take you care for, of it. Thank, thank you for being here, marking interns. Those who are here are to love the rest. You usually say that, but I kind of crush that one. And I love just saying, you know the drill. You know the drill. Dude. All right. So what did I learn? The topic of moldy food. So I did not realize how gross food smells and cultivates in containers, bags, at the bottom of a sink. I did not realize how gross and how putrid moldy food was. And to give a little background, Andrew, myself, Matt Heron, we won't go into much detail, but we found some uh, we found some moldy food, man, all over the place. Yeah, we got lazy um, in regards to making sure we've eaten all of our food, and we let a good portion. Uh, too much. Maybe it wasn't a good – it was just way too much. It, it got to the point where – we were pulling out, you know, month old milk and, you know, chicken and rice from like a year ago, even though we've only been here for two months. Like green but, peppers, green, red peppers, orange peppers. Like there was way, who, who's, who's the pepper guy? I don't know, but there was way too many peppers in there. There was a guy who ordered like seven pounds of peppers. Multicolored peppers. Multicolored peppers, a great assortment and didn't eat, and didn't eat a damn thing, dude. It was, it was like, what the heck is going on here? How about the uh, milk you found, dude? Yeah, that wasn't good. I don't even want to talk about it. Yeah, it was green, but we won't have we won't go into detail. Again, we won't talk about the color. Um, but dude, that was nuts. I could not handle that, and it got to the point where there was probably fresh food that we were throwing out, but because it was just off color in some way or just didn't look right, we were we just, just in the mindset it. of throwing out everything. <laughs> we got rid of it. We were like, screw this, can't deal with it. Hold uh, an entire trash bag. Like, big trash bag full of just food that went bad. I'm done with it. Yeah. Gross. So gross. But I'll never, we'll never do that again. Like, we'll no, no, we, what, what we do, we got more efficient. We labeled or we've assigned um, spots on the fridge. Oh, we did? Yes. Where? Okay. I didn't know that, but okay. we did. Good. And there are, there are shelves for each person now. So they know what food is, who, which food is whose. And perfect. So we'll know who's green pepper guy now. Yeah. Oh, my God. Can't wait to see who that is. But what did I learn? Uh, enough of the moldy food because I've had enough. Yeah, did that turn your stomach over there a little bit? Yeah, I didn't like any of it. I'm sorry. And I apologize, marketing interns for Declan's. What did you learn? So what did I learn? I learned... Uh, Don't unap- apologize for that. You're right. Anyways, continue. I'm sorry, Declan. That's okay. You can apologize there, yeah. What did I learn? I learned, and this is very important. I think this is important for the back pocket and important for anyone in that, in that with that regard. Live locally, grow locally. That's what I learned. It's very um, important and impactful to look within your community when trying to um, get just household items because they're people. those are people that are growing, and why not try to support them? As an entrepreneur like we are, why not try to support other people? One perfect example, and this is why I thought of it, was – after the Coach Caruso interview, we ended up going to Yam House that night. So we had a concert, and a Yam House absolutely killed it. It was the coolest experience. And we had to get some beers beforehand to, you know, do, a little, do a little pregame because we had a little pregame party for Yam House. So we had a, the local the local brand, or the local band, Yam House. Absolutely. And we, we had a people over to take to the event because we wanted to show Yam House the back pocket puts out, shows out. And we went to our... Um, liquor store and we got local beer because they had a little sample station there and we just got we went all in Declan had one of the coolest sales pitches with one of their representatives while I was trying all the beers Abel beer that's the name Abel beer a b l e beer and I was more than willing and able to purchase a six pack and yourself a six pack because Abel beer yeah why not those guys were awesome they they're local and Andrew and I like you said just got to push the local because we want to grow where we're at, you know, like this is a great opportunity to, you know, connect with other people who are hustlers. Like these guys, we could have easily been the two, uh, the girl and the guy, we could have easily been them selling beer to other people. And I always put myself in their position. Like how cool would it be if we, you know, gave some taste test to these, some people, they liked it and then they went and bought our stuff and then they went promoted it. So we did that exactly that. We literally bought it. We, we drank them. 
and then we just started Instagram storing every it. single thing that we did with those Able Beer. We was and the rest of the night was tagged Able Beer because we just wanted to show them we support your local movement. We love them, dude, and we're gonna we're gonna continue to support Able. I'm sure they, not, this is not a sponsor. Like we no, didn't get any sponsorship no, from Abel, no, but we, we have to talk about them. Yeah, they didn't pay us in anything. We actually paid them with our with buying the beer, but yeah, it was just fun. I, I enjoyed it, and I hope they enjoyed it. Yep, that's what I learned. Um, let's do a feel good story. Let's dude, finish up with a feel good story. Dude, let's finish strong. With that, man. Positive note to leave you guys off on the right foot, and this is this is going to be the theme of the whole show, and it's it's got to do with the gratitude and the thankfulness that. We've just embodied throughout this hour and 10 minutes, I'd assume, right now. Yeah, where, where are we at? We, uh, I'm not going to do any math, but yeah, I'm thinking hour seven. Hour seven. And this has to go with our where we started, St. Thomas football and the St. Thomas community, everyone within, our friends, our teacher, our professors, the, the two presidents, the current and post-president that we had on our show, um, the alumni, every single aspect that and person that went into this back pocket started with St. Thomas. I, it wouldn't be... I wouldn't be here with you today without St. Thomas. Yeah. St. Thomas brought us together naturally, and they've really helped us out too. I mean, a lot of our audience is built um, from St. Thomas specifically. So, yeah, really no- nothing but gratitude, but also just understanding if you're if you're someone who is in college right now or you are an alumni of a proud institution, you know, there's always ways to help out, and there's always ways to take advantage of opportunities. So for the people that are in college, take advantage of every single opportunity and every resource that you have in that school. And if you are an alumni, give back, not with money necessarily if you don't have any, but give back the lessons, the abilities, all the things that you learned to better help these ne- the, the next generation and these people that are, were in your shoes you know, not too long ago. It's all, it was incredible. Do you want to take 60 seconds to try to name off? Every single person, or not, as many people as we can think of that at St. Thomas. Yep. Um, I'll do five. Let's, let's go alternate. Let's okay. alternate people. Dane Mosier. Dr. Dean Don Weimkoff. John Abraham. Dr. Brendo. Dr. Roxanne Pritchard. Craig E. Bosher. Mark Amick. Austin Lorch. Steve Harrell. Mallory Jensenwold. President Sullivan. Annie Vitale. Jill Mansky. Coach Walsh. Oh, Charlie Dowdle. Um, Dr. Kavala. Ooh, um, Coach Coach Jones. Ooh, I got another one. John Jensville. Matt Heron. Rick Vitale. Annie Vitale. I said that one already. Damn it. Um, and we apologize if we, if we didn't say your name right there, but we just wanted to say that was just a short list of all the people that impacted us. There were so many more. So many more. How about uh, Coach Jones? Coach Jones. I already said Coach Jones. President Emeritus. Uh, Dr. Dees. No, oh, Father Dees. Yeah. Father Dees. Father Jim. Absolutely. I mean, the list goes on. We could continue to think of names. It's been the coolest experience. Mm-hmm. Experience. And yeah, they've, they've built us from the ground up. Stand on the, the shoulders of giants. Yeah, we wouldn't be... Wow, what's, the, what's the quote on that one? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, um, it, it has to do with legacy. So it's stand yeah. on the, the shoulders of... Of, you're standing on the shoulders of giants when it comes to what you've accomplished because you wouldn't have been doing those things without the people before you. That's exactly what we're saying. And that's the message we want to give you guys, man. So we hope you enjoyed this podcast. We cannot wait for the next Opportunity Podcast 66. We got a massive guest. We're stoked about it. I can tell you just yet. We'll see you next week. Take care. Take care. <laughs>